Welcome, everyone. This is the first of our new series of Civica Data Science Seminars for the 2022-2023 academic year. These are interdisciplinary seminars that are organized by the partner institutions of the Civica Network and that cover the use of novel methodological and data-driven approaches. In these seminars, we draw from machine learning and quantitative methods within biology, sociology, political science, economics, and physics, among other disciplines. Information on this can be found at social science, socialdatascience.network or on the DSI website. And I'm coming to you today live from the um, Data Science Institute or DSI at London School of Economics. Today, the DSI is very proud to host Professor Anne Beaulieu, Director of the Data Science Research Center at the University of Groningen. Anne recently published her book, Data Science and Society, a critical introduction with Sabina Leonelli. Drawing from this, she is going to consider the job of a data scientist, which has been hailed as one of the most exciting and emerging roles of the past decade. And we are gonna find out today who data scientists are and how you become one, as well as the dilemmas and the achievements that are contained in data-driven work. With that, I am very happy to turn it over to you, Anne, and mute myself. So thank you so much, uh, Ken Benoit, for this introduction. Thank you also to Erica Thompson for the invitation and uh, to Dave Poole and uh, Dario Rodiero, Rodi, Rodiguero uh, for uh, helping me set uh, things up for today's talk. So um, let me uh, give you a very brief overview of uh, what I will be talking to you about today. Uh, first, students uh, often hear me talk about uh, the importance of contextualization when talking about data, and I'm going to attempt to uh, walk the talk by providing a little bit of context of where this particular talk is coming from today. I will also touch, uh, though maybe not fully answer, the million dollar question when it comes to data science. And then we'll really get into uh, the main topic of today, which is why uh, I think of data science as a team sport and therefore of data scientists as uh, team athletes. We'll talk about why this team aspect is uh, so important, why you actually can't live uh, without it, and uh, end with some uh, ideas, some emerging issues uh, around which teams of uh, data scientists uh, have a lot of work that they can do in a very meaningful way. So as you mentioned, uh, Ken, I am drawing today on uh, this book, Data Science and Society, uh, that I co-wrote with uh, Sabina Leonelli uh, from the University of Exeter. Um, and this was a book that really uh, uh, came uh, through the impetus of developing a minor. This minor program is called DataWise Data Science and Society, which is offered uh, at the University of Honinge. And these are some of the key colleagues also involved in this initiative. Um, and I'm especially uh, pleased that I am joined today. Uh, in front of me are 60 students who have just started on this minor uh, this week. So this is their second uh, day of uh, the introductory course uh, that is at the very head of this minor. Um, and uh, this is our fourth edition of this minor. So uh, this, these uh, interactions with students have also been feeding much of what I'm going to talk about today. Most recently, we have expanded uh, data-wise into a full bachelor program, which is offered at uh, the Campus Friesland faculty of the University of Groningen. So all this to say that really we uh, have a lot of uh, momentum around our particular approach to uh, learning data science. And um, that gives me a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of faith in this, uh, this team science approach I'll be talking about today. So who are we talking about when we talk about uh, data scientists? Well, um, data scientists uh, have uh, been hailed as a new professional role. Um, this has been uh, hailed as such for about a decade now. 
Um, data scientists have been said to be uh, doing the sexiest job of uh, the 20th century. Uh, and indeed, around a lot of this excitement about what a uh, data scientist might do, um, there have been a lot of big promises. So data scientists were going to help businesses completely reinvent uh, themselves, really capitalize on big data as a new source of revenue, as a new source of uh, business. There was also a lot of hope that uh, data scientists would help personalize and customize uh, products and services that they would unleash intelligence. So all kinds of uh, available uh, um, insights based on data that might actually be sleeping in the databases of all kinds of organizations and companies. Data scientists were gonna be the ones who uh, turn this into very valuable assets uh, for business. Uh, data scientists have also been implemented, uh, have also been charged with implementing uh, machine learning in AI, which is no small task. Now, often uh, in spite of, uh, or maybe even because of all this hype, uh, data scientists have been, uh, uh, have had to kind of deal with these extremely high expectations of what they could do. Um, sometimes the expectations were that uh, by inserting data scientists at, as, at a specific point or in a very specific subunit of an organization, all these wonderful promises could be realized. Um, of course, uh, uh, data flows are much more complex than being inserted at a single point. That is one of the challenges that data scientists have been dealing with. And of course, uh, in the past decade, we have also seen a mainstreaming of data science. I want to say a little bit more about this mainstreaming and what it means uh, for data scientists. Um, these four circles, I will say a lot more about that in a minute, um, but for now I want to draw your attention to the people who are working kind of on the edge of the work of uh, data scientists. I call them para-professionals, and um, this group is quite important. Uh, they, as partners uh, who are maybe placed in other parts of the organizations and who are sparring partners for data scientists. They are also very important in helping organization ask the right questions uh, that data scientists can try to address. To apply the outcomes of data scientists work responsibly and also to test and improve to provide the right kind of feedback uh, to data scientists. So this is an important kind of maybe less sexy uh, kind of work than being a data scientist, but still a very important one that has grown a lot through this mainstreaming of, uh, of data science. I will focus for the rest of today on data scientists, but I did want to mention uh, that particular golden circle that is really the allies within organizations for data scientists. So what is a data scientist? Easy enough uh, to answer. That is someone who does data science, but that only brings us into some kind of regress because then we need to answer the million dollar question, what is data science? Data science is many things um, and very often uh, to describe data science, Venn diagrams have been used and abused. And uh, here are just a few of the very, very many examples um, used to describe data science. Uh, this one is from 2010. And generally, this is considered to be the first uh, attempt at visualizing data science using this kind of Venn diagram. So the idea is that you have different areas and the place where they meet, that, that core, that golden middle, that would be data science. Now. Um, almost immediately, uh, there was a lot of critique about hacking skills. So hacking is not always considered to be uh, the most uh, noble way of describing uh, what some of these professionals do. So very quickly, there were alternative uh, versions where uh, computer science was used as a label rather than hacking. Um, 
also interesting, uh, and a lot could be said about you know which uh, areas or which kinds of expertise get brought into these Venn diagrams. One thing that I find especially fascinating is um, this idea that you have domain expertise. Okay, so that you would have a specific. Um, so if you're working in a um, uh, an automotive context, then the domain expertise would be, you know, having to do with the automotive industry. Or if you are working in a medical setting, then the domain expertise would be the, the medical expertise that you would bring in. Now, that may seem commonsensical, but it does raise for me very important questions about why the other circles would be generic. So why is it that those are not domain specific uh, types of uh, expertise, types of knowledge? And I think there's very interesting things to be said there about the way the industry developed, where um, rather than having in-house platforms, in-house uh, computer scientists developing tools, we started to see really big tech uh, producing generic platforms that they were eager to uh, present as being um, suitable to roll out uh, everywhere. Again, we could have a very long uh, discussion on, on uh, these. Uh, this is the one that we use at the Data Research Center. So we actually have four domains of expertise that we think are especially important. They also all come back within, uh, within the minor. Now, um, I've shown a few. There are many, many, many more. This is just one page of a uh, Google search on Venn diagram uh, data science. So a lot of versions of exactly what the labels should be, how they come together, how to uh, uh, understand the intersections of these. But um, after uh, spending quite a bit of time getting a sense of uh, which areas were considered uh, most important for data science, um, I started to concentrate more on what is indicated here by the yellow squiggle. Because really, I think that what is uh, so telling about this multiplication of all these Venn diagrams is um, not so much which bits are being brought together, but the fact of bringing uh, these different expertise into conversation. So it's the interaction that is actually what makes data science special not so much precisely which kind of expertise that you are bringing in. So my um, answer to the million uh, dollar question is uh, really uh, to be found by focusing on the intersection, on the interaction between these different areas and not only on their coexistence and on which specific areas of expertise. Now, this um, brings us to maybe uh, the most important update uh, of that claim that data science is the sexiest job, um, because uh, it may be the sexiest job, but it's also a team sport. And here we might get too many mixed uh, metaphors. So from here on, I will uh, focus mainly uh, on the team sports aspect of this. So what does it mean to say that uh, data science is uh, team science? Now in uh, the Netherlands right now and in Europe uh, more broadly, there is a very important movement to uh, um, increase the attention that is paid to team science in science policy. So, um, it's uh, considered increasingly important to pay attention not only to you know, wonderfully brilliant individuals, but to actually sustain and support and nurture teams because that is where the real breakthroughs, the real advancements in science are being done, not in lone geniuses. Um, I wanna focus specifically on data science today, but I think it's interesting to note that data science might actually be the exemplar for how, how many other fields of science are increasingly uh, trying to get to work. So data science is team science because of the complexity. So data science requires many kinds of work, many kinds of expertise uh, in order to be successful. It also requires coordination. So it's not enough for these different kinds of expertise to be working side by side. Um, take a 
very common question that you will have in almost any data science uh, project, which is which data to collect. In order to answer that question uh, adequately, appropriately, you really need to have coordination between uh, different types of expertise. You need uh, to be able to collect data that is relevant to the question that you want to answer. You need to collect data in a way that makes computational sense, in a way that will not overwhelm the tools and the resources that you have. You also need to uh, collect data in a way that's methodologically sound. So even to do just one single task within a data project, you need to have coordination between uh, the different uh, types of expertise, which makes it a team sport. You also have the issue of distribution. Uh, so in the Netherlands, sometimes we speak of a sheep with five legs, you know, someone who is uniquely uh, gifted in a wide variety of skills. Um, uh, very few individuals actually possess the skills uh, across the board. And finally, in terms of scale, uh, projects tend to be too large for a single person, sometimes even for a single team. And you really need that uh, distributed team-based organization. So again, um, thinking back to that yellow squiggle uh, that links the different types of expertise, um, decisions in data projects can best be taken through this combination of different types of expertise. Um, but that requires a very strong ability to work together. So you have to have a sense of what the other expertise is about. Uh, you need all kinds of interactional skills, communication skills, listening skills, and um, also a very deep-rooted respect for the input uh, of others and a recognition that all the contributions of all members uh, are essential. Now, that is uh, one of the reasons why data science teaching and training um, is increasingly uh, seeking to incorporate interdisciplinary elements in the teaching. So being exposed in a first instance to all these different types of expertise, um, but also to provide students with skills uh, for this multidisciplinary teamwork and uh, to expose students to real world rather than textbook. Uh, problems. Now, the idea that this is kind of, uh, if not a fail-safe uh, uh, spell, at least the beginning of the different steps that you need in order to create data scientists who are able to deal with the complexity, with the issues of coordination and entwinement uh, that are uh, going to arise when working in a team. So, um, you know, I think uh, this may sound, you know, like uh, a kind of uh, motherhood and apple pie issue, something that everybody kind of embraces, endorses. Of course, this is the way to go. Uh, but uh, there are things that make it more difficult to work in this way. And one of these is the disciplinary knowledge that tends to shape how, how a lot of teaching, how a lot of programs and degrees are set up. So disciplinary knowledge uh, helps you focus on a certain domain of inquiry. So, you know, engineers have claimed a part of the world, sociologists have claimed a different part of the world, um, literary scholars have claimed a different part of the world. So there is an expertise that is associated with a particular domain. And there's kind of a logical connection that they don't need to defend, that they don't need to explain, that seems kind of obvious. Uh, that corresponds to a kind of expertise. Within disciplines, we also tend to agree on how to define problems. If you're a sociologist, you have a particular sense of how to define a sociological question. If you're a literary scholar, you have a sense of uh, what kinds of problems or questions are uh, going to be considered good questions uh, to address in your field, given the set of tools. And um, we also tend to have agreement on what counts as evidence in order to solve or to start to address those questions. Um, uh, we often speak of these distinctions between uh, more formal or more uh, uh, quantitative approaches versus more interpretative or qualitative approaches. 
these uh, kinds of divides are very much fed by this disciplinary approach to teaching. And again, you might say, well, these are all good things. Um, but of course, every coin uh, has uh, two sides. And uh, by being too uh, disciplined, being too trained, having uh, too much of our common sense when it comes to doing research or to investigating shaped by this disciplinary lens, we uh, uh, start to have barriers to the kind of teamwork that is necessary for data science. So to illustrate this a little bit further, I wanna talk about uh, beta testing and how that might be a setting where uh, distinctions between disciplines, between different orientations to um, what it means to test, what it means for something to work might really come to the fore. So let's take testing as an example. Um, here is um, uh, kind of a humorous uh, rendition of how distinctions uh, or clashes uh, might occur. So um, what it means to have a friendly user, what it means for a product to be ready to be inflicted um, on users um, is, is described here uh, in a joking form. A little bit more formally, uh, when thinking about a test, these are five different dimensions that you might use in order to test an application. User experience, load and stress test, device and platform compatibility, battery consumption, um, and content testing. Now, I think you can all imagine that uh, somebody who's able to uh, accurately uh, evaluate the results of a battery test might be quite different from someone who is able to evaluate user experience. This requires a very different kind of evidence. You would collect very different types of data uh, in the course of pursuing a test. And uh, those responsible for these five different aspects might also have very different um, understanding of what it means for the application to be ready for something to work, to be successful enough uh, to move from beta testing to rolling out. You might also think that um, these might not also be uh, flat differences, but that in some projects, the user experience might be extremely important, or that in other projects, um, the content testing might be very important. So these five different aspects might not be you know, equally weighed or considered next to each other, but might be very much in a hierarchy in relation to each other, um, also putting members of the team uh, in a hierarchy in relation to you know, what they want to deliver for the project. So um, I uh, am sharing a quote here uh, that really captures the, uh, one of the important um, uh, aspirations of uh, contemporary teaching of data scientists. And uh, this is taken from a report uh, on, uh, that was published a couple of years ago uh, in the United States about developing curriculum for data science in the United States. And here, uh, the cyclical aspect, uh, the multiplicity of the kinds of things that you have to learn um, are really stressed. And um, to me, the very last word of this quotation is very important. Uh, they are part of the, they are the core of the data science experience. So in order to learn data science, um, there's a very strong experiential element uh, that uh, is very conducive to becoming uh, expert in this area. So having uh, taken this on board, I wanna say just a few words about how uh, we have translated this into how uh, we think uh, team science is best learned. So um, as uh, some of you sitting here are experiencing uh, right now, um, we uh, have developed innovative uh, programs in terms of how education is organized. So really with um, uh, cross faculty teaching uh, so that not only the students sitting in the, in the classroom uh, are coming from different faculties, but also uh, the teachers who appear in front of them. 
in developing partnerships so that uh, there is a real experience. So it's not a fake textbook, uh, shallow type of experience, but really the full messiness of what it means to work in a real life um, experience with a partner from outside the university. So that uh, enables uh, students uh, to start asking the right questions of the data through this iteration of uh, you know, trying, of experiencing uh, what might work um, and moving iteratively towards answering them in the right way. Um, and here, I really want to stress that answering something in the right way, um, we mean that in the, in the different sense of right. So right in the sense of correct, but also right in uh, maybe the more moral sense of uh, producing data science that is responsible and that is accountable. So it also takes a, uh, an ethical dimension in how data science is pursued. So uh, um, again, uh, indicating the inspiration uh, from the minor and the consolidation of these insights into, uh, into our book. Um, uh, there's really three components of knowledge, uh, skill, and attitude. Um, and here uh, they are really consolidated and brought together in terms of the main areas of uh, knowledge that we consider to be essential. Uh, in terms of the skills, uh, that are uh, really crucial to being able to pursue data science, um, but also of the attitude, which again are something that you develop through experience, through uh, working in groups. Now, I um, want to move on uh, a little bit to talk about, um, you know, kind of a counterfactual. Um, you know, probably most uh, people can get behind the idea of data science as a uh, as a, a team endeavor. Um, but you know, how crucial is it? Uh, to what extent is it really uh, essential? Um, what will what would go wrong if uh, data science were not pursued in a team in an interdisciplinary type of way? So I want to talk about the use of mobile phone data, which has been an absolute boon for uh, a lot of data science. What I'm sharing with you now are some uh, impressive numbers uh, up to 2018 from the Global ICT uh, Development Overview. So this shows per 100 inhabitants worldwide, so globally, what uh, the penetration of different uh, technologies are. So um, in orange, you see active mobile broadband subscriptions. And uh, in blue, so the top line, you see uh, mobile cellular telephone subscriptions. So these are the numbers of subscriptions that uh, people have worldwide. Um, again, please note uh, per 100 inhabitants, and uh, in 2018, we were hitting um, 107. So um, on average, more than one subscription per inhabitant. Now, if you think that in some areas um, that might vary, that might be quite a bit lower, uh, it means that in some parts of the world, uh, quite a few, quite a significant proportion of people actually have uh, multiple subscriptions. Now, um, this kind of data has been used for all kinds of inquiry, uh, for network analysis, uh, for um, uh, all kinds of explorations of applied mathematics, um, but also uh, to ask very sociological questions in terms of how people uh, enter networks. However, uh, even before you start to use this data, it's very important to have uh, insights about where this data is coming from and what, what it can actually mean. So um, one common assumption when using uh, telephone data, and uh, I'd invite you uh, in the coming weeks when you come across um, articles or sources where phone data is being used, pay attention to whether this assumption is being made. 
that one phone subscription means uh, one user. You'll, I think you'll be surprised at how often that assumption is actually being made. Okay, so um, of course, one thing that might uh, give the lie to this assumption is um, a single user having two phones. Um, I see some smiling faces, perhaps some uh, in this room uh, are already carrying uh, two phones. Now, this immediately uh, shatters your assumption of one user, one phone, and raises all kinds of questions of why there might be these kinds of distinctions. You might think of distinctions of uh, work in private, but you might also think of distinctions of uh, types of use. So one phone for photography and one phone for the rest or um, uh, different uh, uh, regional use. So when you're in Belgium, you use one phone When you're in the Netherlands, you use another phone. Okay, so there might be all kinds of um, uh, specialized use attached to one or the other phone that would really shape how uh, your data looks. Another possibility to give the lie to this assumption is the use of multiple SIM cards uh, for a single phone. Again, all kinds of uh, reasons for this, maybe uh, concerns for privacy or maybe economic uh, influences where, um, you know, for some types of uh, communication or use, one SIM card might be better than the other, or maybe again, linked to uh, where people are traveling to. Um, uh, again, completely undermines this assumption of one phone, one user. Um, there are also all kinds of uh, situations where a phone is being used uh, collectively. So um, uh, last time I visited uh, my mother in Canada who does not have a smartphone. I uh, somehow had left my phone here in the Netherlands. I was visiting her in Canada, and when we would be going around every um, half an hour or so, she would say, oh, look up on your phone, such and such. So coming up with a request, effectively making her kind of a co-user of my phone, even though uh, she does not have her own subscription. So that is another case of uh, communal use of a single device that would undermine the assumption. Um, and as we saw uh, a little earlier in terms of contagion around uh, the use of apps like Strava, we also know that there are group effects. Um, it's very, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, ways in which we use our devices that are highly shaped by the way others around us use uh, their devices. So which platforms you use, which apps you use, um, whether you use phones in uh, social situations or not, that is very much shaped by how the other users around you uh, are using their phone. So again, complicating that relationship between one user, one phone. Now, I'm really milking that particular example, but that is just one example in which um, things could go terribly wrong because uh, you might not have the expertise to really interrogate the assumptions that you're making about the data. Hence, um, the importance of having these multiple multidisciplinary teams. Okay, now um, I want to move on uh, and end with a few examples of how um, uh, data science uh, work matters um, and uh, also make a few remarks about the kinds of careers that data scientists uh, might be having. Now, um, making a career in data science uh, is also different than making a career if you have very monodisciplinary training. Some of the ways in which it's different, um, the job market in data science is very strongly shaped by portfolio development and by the demonstration of skills. Okay, so that means that, um, you know, simply, uh, um, asserting that you have a particular degree or asserting that you have a particular skill is not, uh, that's not enough. So um, it means um, uh, being able to show what you can do and not simply say or prove that you have a particular um, uh, a degree. 
Now, this requires investment, uh, often um, hack hackathons or these types of events where you're actually kind of developing your portfolio uh, for free, providing uh, labor to um, particular companies who take part in these hackathons, for example. That is a way to develop your portfolio, but it's also, you know, kind of having to provide free labor in order to really develop your profile and develop your portfolio. So there's a kind of um, yeah. uh, expectation that you will be very entrepreneurial about uh, developing yourself as a data scientist. So that's quite different than relying on formal credentials. So whereas, um, you know, how, uh, how excellent your degree was, whether you had uh, cum laude with your degree or which institution your degree was from, that that was very meaningful. That is quite a different story when um, you're being judged based on a portfolio on demonstrations of what you are able to do. It's a different, uh, different kind of capital that you have to uh, use to establish yourself. Not surprisingly, uh, because formal credentials are less important, contacts, uh, interactions, networks are much more uh, important so that the skills and the, the interest in actually uh, doing Doing this also becomes more important. Um, and uh, in sociology, there's a saying, birds of a feather flock together. So within a network, you tend to have people who are like you. And that has a very important effect on what data science looks like, right? So if you're recruiting other data scientists from your own network, they will tend to be people like you. And this is one, not the only one, but one of the important elements um, that is at the root of the lack of diversity in data science. So that network effect uh, is, uh, is a really important and sometimes um, uh, really needs correction. However, um, 10 years on, um, sometimes this job of data science is regarded with some cynicism. Um, I have heard colleagues kind of shake their heads and say, you know, the brightest minds are actually being employed at making uh, Instagram even more addictive. Um, I don't think that that is uh, the be all and end all of being a data scientist. And I want to end with what I think are some really exciting challenges where data scientists can make a difference. There are all kinds of new civic roles uh, that data scientists might embrace. Um, think about uh, journalism and uh, media. Um, in uh, the Netherlands, we have one of the uh, main actors uh, who gave rise to Bellingcat as a new kind of uh, journalism, a data-driven journalism, where uh, by being very analytic, very, being very critical, and using the tools of data science, you were able to find patterns to unearth really important data um, and evidence about important, socially important news stories that otherwise would have remained um, uh, unseen. Uh, a lot of this work also goes on around um, images, so analyzing uh, in a kind of forensic way the authenticity of images in order to uh, document crimes of war, for example, also very important work. Um, NGOs and civil society are also increasingly having data scientist teams on board because uh, uh, that can also enhance their work. And certainly in terms of um, governance and oversight, and here um, with apologies to the people online, but I'll point back to the discussion we had about how we can protect ourselves as uh, citizens. Um, there's also a lot of work uh, for data science teams in terms of ensuring uh, privacy, ensuring autonomy, uh, ensuring the proper functioning of the public, public sphere. So let me flash just a few uh, evocative ideas um, at you to, uh, to end this talk. What you could do as uh, data science um, superheroes. Um, Pathfinders is uh, yeah. one of the exemplary uh, uh, organizations where uh, data is being gathered on uh, levels of democracy, levels of uh, participation in civil society, and uh, in trying to document either progress or shortcomings 
really trying to put these issues of human rights, of proper governance, um, of uh, uh, justice uh, in the limelight and to document uh, these. Another way in which uh, data superheroes uh, can make a difference, um, femtech or uh, apps technologies to trace ovulation and uh, menstruation have uh, been used uh, increasingly in the past decade. As the political situation changes, as um, rights to proper health care are being uh, severely limited, the data that is contained in these apps is also becoming extremely sensitive. Um, and there is a very, very important uh, political and uh, uh, humanitarian set of uh, actions that can be taken there by data scientists to ensure that this data is not used in ways um, that uh, counter uh, women's human rights. And um, a final uh, example where uh, teams of data superheroes might come into action in terms of mobility. Some of you might have had encounters with these machines uh, at airports where biometrics are increasingly used to uh, facilitate mobility, but also to limit the mobility of others. Um, we know that biometrics tend to reproduce um, bias and uh, increase harm uh, to particular groups, having dark skin or not having uh, um, uh, the usual body composition or having worked as a cleaner where your uh, fingerprints are not legible by these uh, biometric machines. Um, so there's all kinds of issues there in order to develop the just uh, systems. Um, a brief sketch of all the back and forth and the really complex data that goes on uh, through this very uh, seemingly simple uh, action that lasts just a few seconds, but that actually uh, requires a whole infrastructure. Um, and one very interesting group uh, processing uh, citizenship. This is a research program that has been looking at how uh, different databases in uh, Europe are actually managing data about uh, migrants, uh, how different features are incorporated into different identity systems, and how that actually uh, influences people's opportunities to uh, be granted status as uh, legal workers or as refugees. So again, a very forensic way of looking at how particular features are actually creating chances or creating barriers uh, for people. So uh, a little antidote to some of the cynicism uh, around uh, what it means to be uh, data science. And um, I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Anne, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you from our online audience as well as from your in-person audience. Um, I think, uh, you know, we certainly recognize what you say about the messy and experiential aspects of data science. Uh, so I'd like to invite the online audience to ask questions. You can either type them into the, uh, the chat here and I will ask them or you can put your hand up in the usual way and I will call on you to ask that question. Maybe I can just get us started while you're typing um, and ask Anne perhaps to say a bit more about uh, the distinction that you made between getting the correct answer or a responsible and accountable answer. I wondered if you might have some examples or sort of to just illustrate that a bit more, because I know that it isn't always clear to people coming at this for the first time what the difference is between a correct answer, you know, and the, the, the other idea of a, a right answer. Maybe you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, um, indeed. Some of my favorite examples have to do with, um, on the one hand, uh, um, aiming for the computationally uh, most uh, agile uh, answer uh, versus uh, maybe the empirically most uh, correct answer. And in a lot of data science uh, projects, you really have to um, uh, weigh the trade-off uh, and that is, of course, uh, highly contextually dependent, uh, taking us back to uh, to the very beginning. Um, you know, if you're preparing uh, to launch a rocket, then uh, 
getting things absolutely right uh, is uh, crucial. If you are looking for the nearest pizza place, you know, plus minus uh, a half kilometer is not going to make a difference. So um, it's really being able to make explicit what are going to be the criteria for what is the correct answer. Um, and are we really uh, making the right trade-off between, you know, what might be computationally better uh, as opposed to empirically uh, more accurate? Um, and, and being able to have that conversation in very explicit terms, I think leads to, to better uh, outcomes. Thank you, yes. Uh, I wonder if we have any questions. I'd like to invite people to either put a hand up or to put a question into the chat. Uh, we have one question which asks uh, quite a general one, how to develop skills as a data scientist? Would that be something, you know, maybe thinking about the, the themes of your talk rather than the, the, the sort of technical skills, but maybe thinking about what are the kinds of things that people could be doing if they're perhaps an undergraduate, what sorts of things should they be looking to do to be developing all of these other skills which you've emphasized are so important? Yeah, um, so I think uh, the, the most effective way of developing further skills is uh, really by doing, so seeking the experience um, and uh, maybe just thinking very pragmatically. Uh, recently, we have all been um, submersed into all kinds of new platforms, all kinds of new applications for education. So certainly uh, if I were a student in uh, that kind of context, um, I think I would look very close to home and start examining um, what are the tools, what are the contexts, uh, and what are the effects of uh, that particular turn to really um, uh, highly mediated uh, modes of interaction that we are having uh, in the university. Um, there's also a lot of work uh, to be done there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another interesting question, is there any initiative whereby data scientists could pledge, like doctors, not to harm or endanger other humans in the course of their work. That's an interesting one. Is there a Hippocratic oath for the data scientists? Yeah, um, I don't know of an oath. Uh, I do know of codes of conduct. Uh, several of these have been uh, put forth by uh, professional associations where they try to articulate you know, a set of eight to 10 points um, that are really important dimensions for data scientists to consider, to, to pledge to. Um, and actually uh, one of the last chapters of our book uh, is on responsible data scientists. And um, it's very important to also see the institutional and societal dimension of responsible data use. At the same time, as a professional, uh, as an expert, as a researcher, there are also things that you can do as an individual. And uh, we try to articulate um, uh, some of these. So uh, besides an oath, you can also think of um, processes like having data audits early on in uh, the process to really examine, OK, which flows are we setting up? Which categories are we reifying into the development uh, of our work? Uh, so that is also kind of an instrument that is fairly small scale that as an individual, you can actually uh, stimulate your team to start adopting or to experiment with if, uh, if adopting is a step too far. Uh, but where as a data science professional, you can, you can start to move towards more ethical practices. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so we have someone else asking, how often will there be the opportunity to learn on the job versus having to acquire all the skills to get a position? So you mentioned, uh, you know, having to have that portfolio and demonstrate skills rather than being, you know, just getting in on the strength of a course or a qualification. Um, do you think that there is that opportunity now for people to learn on the job or is that becoming more difficult? Um, I think that is absolutely uh, essential. Um, and I uh, would say certainly given the current uh, job market to where um, it seems very difficult to uh, find people, I think that employers will also be uh, extremely keen to create the conditions that make it possible for people to keep developing because, um, you know, it's not so easy to simply uh, look, look further if uh, the people who are in-house are not, uh, are, are not. Yeah, and now we have a few questions coming in about how to uh, how to expand a portfolio and where to look for um, ways to engage in maybe voluntary projects or maybe paid projects, but how to 
how to kind of expand that experience and make it visible to employers effectively. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think the most obvious uh, one would be this whole uh, ecology of hackathons and other uh, types of activities, uh, challenges, uh, and so on. Um, I do, uh, you know, I think we should not be naive uh, about these. They are about uh, free labor. Um, they do uh, have outputs that are extremely valuable to the companies who put forth uh, these, um, uh, however, increasingly uh, NGOs and governments uh, are, all, are also developing uh, some activities. So it's also possible to do this kind of in, in a more public spirited way, um, but it remains, it remains a yeah, there's a free labor issue there that I'm not uh, entirely comfortable. Uh, yes, yes, but there is the opportunity for the ethical data scientists to find opportunities which are uh, more public spirited. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to take any questions from your in person audience. I do have a couple more online questions here or. Yeah, I, I see some hands here. So let me take a, Go on, why don't you take a couple there and then we'll come back. OK, thank you. Especially as uh, commercial um, companies use data, uh, will we see um, them use more involving more people? So all types of people, do they have so much data and involving everyone in their uh, uh, commercial pursuits? Or will we see them targeting the masses, more of the average uh, person of the entire uh, population? Okay. Uh, very interesting question. So the question is about uh, whether there's a trend towards more personalization versus more uh, uh, appeal to the masses, if I understood uh, correctly. Um, um, in all humility, uh, that's a bit outside my specific uh, area of uh, uh, expertise um, to say something really broad about uh, uh, those kinds of trends. Um, maybe one thing that that is of interest uh, that I can add um, is the tension between, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, customization, and on the other hand, personalization, uh, which require a different orientation to the kinds of data that you might uh, address. So maybe that's uh, an additional way of thinking about it, not only as a binary of uh, standardization versus personalization, but also the element of customization that, uh, that is enabled by using data. Another question from the room. Okay, hey, let's- uh, Go back to online, yes. <laughs> Okay, so I have a, a quite, quite a specific question here. Is it indispensable to learn programming languages like Python or is it more about understanding how to use statistics? Or would you say you have a more a broader conception of what data science is that might encompass people who are not necessarily working directly on uh, sort of large computational projects? Yeah, so um, in this, this uh, spirit of um, the, the teamwork as uh, the main model, um, I would say that what is essential is to really understand why some people on your team absolutely need Python. Um, so if you are able to develop a very good understanding of that, and also understand why some people on your team need uh, an extremely good sense of um, user experience, and other people on your team um, have to have a big sense, a really good sense of what the computational um, uh, consequences are of particular design choices. Um, if you're able to really understand without having that expertise yourself, but being able to place it, um, to understand how in the landscape of your project, all those elements are essential. Um, I think that is where you become really an invaluable uh, component of, a, of such a team. Great, thank you. Now I have uh, a question about uh, your teaching. So uh, if we asked from your years of teaching, what traits in students do you consider to be an important indicator of future success? So perhaps something for the current students to take note of. And yeah. were there any students or stories that you were particularly impressed by? Um, um, yeah, I think, <laughs> uh, I think the most uh, 
gratifying uh, and perhaps surprising in, in contrast to other kinds of more disciplinary teaching. Um, I think that what is most gratifying to see is the development of particular attitudes. So, um, you know, across all my classes, I have hopes and expectations that students will learn stuff. Uh, but when uh, we see students in this program really develop different attitudes and um, uh, the, the habits of mind, they go along with that of listening, of asking, uh, of checking, um, uh, and um, of valuing the interdependence rather than feeling vulnerable. Um, I think that those are really kind of the, the gold nuggets uh, of this particular program. Fantastic. Um, it's yeah, it is. And maybe in terms of a, a student uh, that, that stands out, um, uh, one of my hobbies is sports, and I tend to use uh, examples from uh, sports to talk about datification. And in uh, the very first year that we had the minor data wise, um, I used football and also showed how uh, football stadiums were uh, actually physically changing in order to support all the infrastructure of the sensors, how there was a little roof for the, uh, the nerdy analysts behind their laptops, um, behind the coach. Um, in the changing room of the players, there's now big screens because they get to see data during, uh, during the breaks. Um, and one of the students decided that that was going uh, to be his career, and he's now working in Sweden as a, as a, a football uh, data analyst. So that was kind of a funny, uh, yeah, kind of felt like I planted a seed there. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm sure many of the people here today, both online and in person, will go on into all sorts of interesting careers. And maybe that's one of the most exciting things about this area of data science is the way that you can take it in so many different directions, whether that's the technical or the more ethical or whether it's, you know, into the, all of these different uh, sectors of society. So thank you so much. For thank you all for being here. Thank you so much again to the speaker, the host and everybody who asked questions. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks and bye bye.